All right, so let's take a look at exponential functions. Um, so a new car is purchased at seventeen hundred dollars. So before I even start, what is the exponential function? I don't know. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my formula sheet, and it's this thing that says reference algebra one formula sheet, and I'm looking for anything um, with exponential function, and here it is. So I'm going to type this in to the calculator so that I'm ready. Y equals a b x. Okay, so y equals a parentheses b raised raised to the x power all right so i've typed in y equals abx that way i can just put my numbers in now the thing about exponential functions is you do have to remember the conversion so you have to know what each thing means so a is initial b is your growth or decay if it's growth it's one plus after you make the decimal um, after you make the percent into a decimal, um, and if it's decay, it's one minus after you make the percent into a decimal, and x is equal to time. So with that, all right, so a new car is purchased for $1,700. Where do I put that? Well, if I purchase it for $1,700, that's my initial. So my initial is A. That's where I'm going to put that. So A is 1700000 000. Be careful what you're putting in. The value of the car depreciates. That means it goes down at this percent. So remember, you got to... Um, the growth and decay is you make the percent into a decimal, and even though it's a decimal right now, I mean get rid of percent, right? And so to get rid of the percent, you do 13.5 divided by 100. Now this is not in a percent, so this is as a decimal. Then you do the um, growth or decay. If it's decay, it's 1 minus. If it's growth, it's 1 plus. And make sure that order is exactly what it is. So the growth, the value of the car depreciates, so that's 1 minus. So in B... It is going to be 1 minus what I had without the percent, which is 0 0.135. All right, so 1 minus, if it's growth, 1 plus, okay? Um, depreciates at 13.5 a year. What's the value of the car to the nearest cent? So that means two numbers after the decimal in 12 years. So what's that? that's time. So that time is X. So we're going to come up here to X, and we're going to put in 12. Notice I type it in before I delete, because if I delete first and then try to type it in, it's going to not stay. Oh, it did. Well, that's fine. All right, so time is 12. If it doesn't stay up here, just put anything here, type it in, then delete what you don't need. All right, so round to the nearest cent. Okay, I'm not good at rounding. That's not a problem. What we're going to do is we're going to type the word round. Tell the calculator, hey, round for me. What do I need you to round? So I need you to round. I need you to round this number. So what I'm going to do is control C, control V, but we're going to put it in parentheses. All right, so the number, I need you to round this number, comma, how do I want it to round? So if you don't know, just start typing in numbers. One, one number after the decimal, so that's not it. Two, two numbers after the decimal, so that's what I'm looking for. So that's cent, this looks like money right now. So this is my answer, 2982.92. All right, perfect. All right, so we've done a growth, let me, I mean a decay, let me do a growth, which this one is. So again, you start off with the formula, okay? I'm going to write my formula twice so I can just replace. What is A? $8,300 is placed in an account. So I place it in the account. This is what I'm doing. This is what I start with. So I'm going to put that number right here. So it's going to be 8300 all right, with an annual interest rate of 6.5%. So remember, anytime you have a percent, you have to get rid of the percent by dividing by 100. Now I just need to know if it's growth or decay. How much is in the account after 14 years? Okay, so this question doesn't tell me if it's growth or decay explicitly, but you think about it. If you take $8,300 and put it in a bank account, would you leave it in the bank account if it goes down? No, you take it out. So that means it has to be growth because otherwise it wouldn't make sense to leave it. So this is a growth question. So remember, your B is your growth, which is 1 plus the number without the percent. And to get rid of the percent, you divided it by 100. So here's the number without the percent. And because it's growth, 1 plus. Okay. How much is in the account after 14 years? What's time? Time is X. So we're going to delete X and put 14. Boom. Round to the nearest cent. So again, you type in the word, hey, calculator, I want you to round, parentheses. What do you want to round, Miss Ainley? I want to round this number, okay? How do you want this number to be rounded, Miss Ainley? Comma. And again, if you forget what to put after that, just put numbers and look at the answer. That's one number 
that's two numbers, that's three numbers, that's four numbers, that's five numbers. If I want cents, I want two numbers after the decimal. That looks like money, so this is my actual answer. Control C, Control V, or oh, that didn't work, or oh, that did work. All right, so growth, one plus, decay, one minus. All right, find growth and decay percentage, level one. You are given, so here, you're given the actual formula. You're given A, B, X, okay? To identify whether the change represents growth or decay. So you're looking at this number right here. Is it bigger than one? Growth. It is less than one? Decay. All right, and why is that? Because remember, for growth, we're going to do one plus some number, right? All right, for decay, we're going to do one minus some number. So let's let's say that number was, I don't know, we're just going to make it up. Boom, 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 that, all right? Because we're adding one to that number, you see how it's bigger than one? If we were subtracting, right, one minus that number, not the number minus one, but the one minus that number, it's going to be smaller than one because we're taking away. All right, so anything bigger than one, growth. Anything um, less than one, decay. All right, so it represents decay. Why? Because that number is smaller than one. All right, determine the percentage rate of increase or decrease. Now, remember, in this case, they've already subtracted, right? They've already subtracted one. They did one minus some number, and they got this answer. So if you imagine this, they did one minus some unknown variable, and they got uh, 0 0.11. That's what that means, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take x to the other side. So I'm going to move it over here. So it's going to go from minus x to what? Plus x, okay? Then I'm going to move this number to the other side, and it's going to go from positive 0 0.11 to what? Negative, so negative. And now this is what I have. This is what x is equal to. And what's x equal? 0 0.89 without the percent. So you see this answer wants a percent? So what do I do to this number to make it a percent? I multiply it by 100. Now, whatever answer you check, you get, you are going to check it. So I'm going to start off with 89. And I want, by the time I make it in here in the parentheses, 1 minus, it should be 0 0.11. I'm going to divide it by 100 because I start off with percent, so that's that. And then I'm going to say 1 minus for my decay, 1 minus. Do I get the same answer? I do. So that I know then 89 is the correct answer. So, of course, if I had uh, multiple choice, just plug in, um, you know, 1 minus, then make the 89 into get rid of the percent by dividing by 100. <clears throat> All right, let's do... All right, let's do this question, okay? So again, remember what we talked about? All right, so I have two options. I have growth, number bigger than one, decay, number smaller than, num than one. So what's this? This is growth, okay? Now, what did I do to this number? I did one plus that number, whatever number it is. So I'm gonna do, I did one plus some random number, right? And then I got equals, 1.059. Now it's pretty obvious. One plus some number is one. Okay, one dollar plus something is one dollar and five five nine cents, right? Okay, so what did I do? I added five nine cents. What I mean by that is this. So some number plus something, one plus some number is five nine cents. So I did that point five nine cents. You see that? Right, addition is a lot easier than subtractions, but we can definitely, instead of, if you didn't understand what I just did, that's fine, we're gonna do it. All right, so I wanna keep X positive, so leave that here. We're gonna take this to the side, it's gonna change from positive one to negative one. All right, so this is what X is equal to, get rid of that so you can see, and that's my number, so it's 0 0.059. All right, but remember, this is without the percent. How do I make that into a percent? You multiply it by 100. All right, so it's 5.9%. Now, remember, do not just put this in blind, blindly. Just check if you did it correctly, right? So what am I going to do? In order to put it in this parenthesis of 1 plus, I'm going to do um, 1 plus. And remember, I got to take the percent, which is 5.9. And I got to get rid of the percent, so I divide by 100. And I should get the number that's in here, which is 1.059. All right, 
I would love to show multiple choice because, you know, multiple choice, um, you just go off the answers instead of really just doing it. Um, so let's look at this one. A town population starts off with 5,800. So that's my initial, correct? So I'm going to be looking at the answers, but I'm also going to write the number in here. So this is, boom, is my initial. So I should see it right here without the comma. All right, so all of them have it by the parentheses. Okay, so that didn't help. All right, keep moving. Shrinks. What does that mean, shrink? DK, which means in B, I should see what? One minus something, right? So which one has one minus something? That has that one minus something. Uh, maybe these do after you subtract. I don't know, so maybe these do. Um, and that's fine. All right, so one minus something at a rate of 2.5. I'm just going to do the question. 2.5, get rid of the percent for me. 2.5, how do I get rid of the percent? Divide by 100. So it should be this number. So it's one minus this number. So I should either have, yep, this has that. This has something different. So it's not this one for sure because this is one minus 0 0.25. So it's not that one. If I put this in the calculator, just the B part to simplify it, it could be this one but it's definitely not that one. So it's not these two. So looking at these, uh, what I have left. And my time is what? In three years. So looking at three, three years, that means over here where X is, put three. All right, that's my answer. So you can actually just put in all of these and see which one gives you this, but we can just look at it. So I need this to raise the power of three. So I'm just gonna prove this in a calculator. That raised the power of three, is the same thing as saying this three times. One, two, three. See that? Same thing, because that's what cube means. The same, you're multiplying this by itself three times. All right, so I can write that as, this is one, two, three, that's four times. It's not that one, we already got rid of that. We got rid of that, so it has to be this one. And again, check in to make sure that this inside is going to give me 0 0.975, it does, and I have it three times, so this part, is 0 0.975 all right so boom three times so again I'm going to take this and show you that it's not going to change so I need instead of putting the power of three what I'm going to do is do this three times so one two three see how the number doesn't change so this is still the correct answer All right, let's do a different one. All right, just one more just to be sure. All right, so we have uh, population is 6,800. So we're going to start right here. Population is 6,800. Control C, Control V. Take out the de uh, comma because the calculator doesn't recognize commas. Grows at a rate of 3.5%. How do I get rid of the percent? I divide by 100. Divide by 100. So I just got rid of the percent. And it's growing, so that means in B, I'm going to do what? 1 plus the number without the percent. Boom. Okay. And then what's the time? Four years. Okay, so I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to do four years. Now, instead of me going through all of these, because maybe it's confusing, I'm just going to copy and paste and see which answer matches right here. So instead of me explaining it this time, I'm going to show you how to cheat with a calculator. So I have this number right here. And I have a one, two, three, four. Make sure it's the same one. So one plus that one, two, three, four. Are those numbers the same? They are, so my answer is A. Okay, but I'm just going to check the other ones just to be sure. So the next one would be 6,800 and then has parentheses, one plus. These the same? No, so that's not the option. Let's look at the next one. This one is one minus, so instead of one plus, it's one minus. And then you're going to put it to the power of four. Is that the same? No, it's not. This next one is 0 0.9. So just changing this 0 0.965. Are those the same? No, it's not. It just so happens that the very first number I checked is the answer. Um, so you could do it with a calculator that way. All right, taking a look at table to exponential function. All right, so remember, if we're inputting it into the calculator, you want to input a table. How would I put in a table? All right, let's click all these buttons and see what they do. What does that do? Oh, gets rid of that. Not that. What does this do? Nothing. Okay, not that. Hit done. 
All right, try this. What does that do? Oh, that's undoing, redoing. Like click the buttons if you forget. Do this. Oh, boom, I found it. Table. All right, so let's take a look at the next one. Table to exponential function. Let's go ahead and put this in the calculator. How do I put it? I don't know, Miss Haley. Let's press all the, uh, all the things and see what happens. Um, none of this is doing anything. So plus, oh, there's a table. Put in the table. So type in exactly what it is. All right, and then, and double check. So here's going to be the issue. Double check your table to make sure that you are typing in exactly what the question is. Um, because that would be your mistake on the ones that you're using a calculator for. All right, so double checking my table. I'm good. That's what I have. Okay, so it's in. Find the exponential function represented by the table. So remember, what's the exponential function again? I don't know, Miss Haley. We're going to go click the formula sheet. All right, so again, click reference. Algebra 1, boom, formula sheet. I'm looking for exponential function. There it is. So y equals ab to the power of x y equals a parentheses b to the power of x so this is my exponential function so find the equation so they're asking you to find this equation okay so what's happening too many variables blah 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 remember two things that you need to do in the computer one is you need to make reference to this so you need to have everywhere you have x have one everywhere you have y have one and please be checking because sometimes it does change so this is y1 and this is x1 because let's talk about too many variables. So you go right next to x and you put a 1. All right, can be defined in terms of each other. What else is wrong? It's because they need this squiggly line. I think it's called delta, not delta. I don't know what it's called. We need that squiggly line. Boom, as soon as I do that, what appeared? The exponential function. So remember, they want the equation. So they want y equals, not these squiggly lines, right? Y equals something like this. All right, so look in here at my answer choices. They're telling me A is 0 0.01, and they're telling me that B is this. So if I do, if I hide this purple, you see this black line? As long as I'm checking my answer now. See this black line? Let's uh, actually like zoom in a little bit. All right, now let me put my purple. Do you see the purple is the black line? That means this is correct. This is the equation. So if they're asking for the graph, you would transfer the graph in, but they're asking for the equation. So you're putting the equation in. Now, they already have this y equals, so let's get rid of this y equal part. And we hit submit. Okay, so you input the table, change the two things in the calculator, put in the answer choice to match the graph, and you're fine. All right, average rate of change comparison. All right, so what this means is there's several. Okay, you got average rate of change from all three. In a previous video, I've gone over each individual one, so I am not going to be taking up a lot of time to do this. So if you need more help, first pause this, go back to um, the other video, and do average rate of change from a graph, average rate of change from a table, average rate of change from an equation, because right now I'm going to be going pretty um, fast. I'm assuming you already know that. I'm just doing the comparison bit. All right, so back to my formula because I don't remember the formula for average rate of change. Let's see what this is. Average rate of change right here. Average rate of change is the change in the y value divided by the change in the x value for two distinct points of the graph. What does that sound like? It sounds like slope. The change in the y values, the change in the x values for two distinct. So that's what I'm going to put here. So hit divide first parentheses minus parentheses over parentheses minus parentheses all right so i'm going to copy this down twice because i'm going to put the formula so remember this is y2 and again right here y2 minus y1 x2 x1 so y2 um y1 x2 y x1 <laughs> all right so again just copying the formula in there just so that you can see me reference it each time so let me put it at the top. So that's my formula. That means I'm just replacing that. All right, let's go read this question. So the average rates of change from the interval bloom. What letter is this? X. So this is the first X. This is the second X. So let's go put those in. So first X is 5, bottom right. Second X is 6, bottom left. So that's my X value for all three. So I'm going to have three answers, right? Graph, I'll do F then G, then H. So graph, table, um, equation. All right, so 
Find the average change from 5 to 6. All right, so from a graph, how do I do that? I go find the number 5. And so this is going 1, 2, 3, 4. So you got to look at how it's counted. So here's the number 5. And what is the graph at 5? So I go to the graph, and I go to the y-axis. It's this point right here. How is this being counted? This is going 5, 10, 15, 20. So it's going negative 5, negative 10, negative 15. So again, at 5, I'm at negative 5. So 5 for the graph, 5 right here, goes with negative 5. Then I'm going to go look for 6. 6 on the x, go to the graph, negative 10. So 6 goes with negative 10. All right, that's my first one. Going to my second one, let's look in this table, and we're looking for matching it with 6. So 6 goes with 7. So we're going to come 7. 6 goes with 7. And 5 goes with 11. Boom. All right, going to the equation. All right, let's say my math is not strong. What we're going to do is copy this equation, because what you have to input is 6 where x is. So here it is. Ooh, that's not how it is. Let's cross that out. All right, let's make sure we type it in correctly. All right, where you see x, we're going to put parentheses because that's going to tell us where to put the number, right? So these are my x values. So where I see x, I'm going to put 6. Boom. So 6 goes with negative 3. And then 5 goes with, put in 5, negative 5. All right, so I've just found average rate of change of all three forms, and this is what they are. Now let's read what the question was asking us to do. So select the option that represents the ordering of the functions according to the average rate of change from least to greatest. So looking at this, what is the smallest number? Negative 5, then negative 4, then 2. So it's actually going in order F, G, H. All right, so F, G, then H. That's what I'm looking for. F first, then G. So this is the correct answer. So get your answer first, put it in the order so you know this is F, G, H, um, and then go and look for what it is that you're looking for here. All right, uh, you're looking at half. When you see the number double, half, triple, quadruple, you know that's exponential function. So again, hey, Miss Ainley, what is that formula for exponential functions? There it is, y, a, b, x. So immediately, I'm always first typing out y, a, b, x so that I know that this is the format that it needs to be in. All right, so a person invests this. So what's that? My initial. So where does my initial go? So we're going to copy this twice so you can see. And my initial, control C, control V, goes in the beginning with no, um, what's this called? Comma. Okay. All right, so that's my initial. In account growing, growing. So that growing means this B has to be what? One plus. If it's decay, it's one minus. All right, growing at a rate, allowing the money to double. Oh, okay, okay. So it's not giving you a percent. So when it doesn't give you a percent, you're just putting in that number. What does the word double mean? How is it growing? twice. All right, so we also have the issue of right now my time also has two times. So we have to put this as a fraction of these two times. And to find this fraction of two times, you're going to put the total over your half-life or the total over your double. So my total is 11. Out of those 11 years, 13 is going to be my um, every doubling. Okay, so it's total time over the double or the half-life, depending whether it's growth or decay. So total over double. All right, so this needs to be rounded to the nearest what? Dollar. So that means how many numbers after the decimal? None, because I don't want any cents. So again, Miss Ainley, I want this calculator to round this number, comma, to have no decimals. So boom, 13, that, whatever that is. Submit. All right, let's do another one. In fact, I want to find there it is, decreases by half. All right, so the process is, in is exactly the same thing. So actually, let me take this. All right, now start the question. Element X has a radioactive isotope that such that every nine years, its mass decreases by half. So its half-life is every nine years. Given the initial mass of initial is this, so put that on your initial. All right, then it's half-life, so that means there's no percent, it's telling you it's half, half, half-life. And then this time is your, ooh, not there, um, to the power of, then divide, yeah. 
total, which is 3, over the doubles or half-life. So double is 9. All right, to the nearest whole number. What does that mean? No decimals. Hey, Miss Ailey, I want this calculator to round parentheses this number so that, oops, oh, that's the wrong one. Control C, Control V, so that, comma, there is no decimal, so no decimal, zero, seven, three, eight, one. All right, so the big thing about these questions is you just need to remember the time is you put in your half or double time on the bottom of your ratio. All right, compounding. All right, so again, listen, I don't know what this formula is. It's something to do with exponential functions, but I have no idea. So let me go see. Oh, boom. There is a formula right there. So we're going to copy this formula into the calculator. So it says capital A equals capital P, parentheses, 1 plus, uh, then I'm going to hit divide, R on the top, N on the bottom, close the parentheses to the power of NT. All right. We'll copy this twice because I'm going to put some numbers in there. All right. All right, so... Starting off with my formula, you do need to know what each thing is. Okay, so this is my final. This, my principal, is my start. So it's still kind of in the form of A, uh, B, X. It's just, it's got a little bit more detail. Okay, equals Y. All right, so this is my final result. This is my initial, so this is still my initial. All this thing is, all of this is my B, and this has got something to do with top. Okay, all right, so most specifically, R is... Um, your interest rate. N is the number of times it's compounded, and you can see N is in twice per year. So if I say it's compounded annually, that number N is 1. Compounded monthly, that number N is 12, because they're 12 months in one year. Compounded daily, that number is 365, because they're 365 days in one year. Compounded weekly, uh, is that 52? 52 weeks in one year, so this will be 52. Uh, compounded what else is there? I might have quarterly. Yeah, quarterly. How many quarters in a year? Four. So this number would be four. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at what our question is. So autumn invested. Boom. So what is that? My initial, correct? So that's my principal. She put my initial amount. She put this into the bank. Get rid of the um, comma. All right, paying an interest rate. So here's the interest rate, which is R of 6.2. Now remember, anytime you're putting a percent in, you got to get rid of that percent, right? How do I get rid of that percent? I divide by 100. So this got rid of my percent. So I can put this as my interest rate right there, okay? All right, compounded monthly. How many months are there in a year? There are 12 months in a year, so this is 12. And the other end, there's another end, so that's 12 as well. Assuming no deposits or withdrawals were made, how much money to the nearest $10, okay, so we're going to come talk about what that is, would be in the account after eight years. So my time is eight. So T is eight. All right, so this is my answer to the nearest, but here's the, this is not saying nearest tenth, so decimals. It's talking about $10, all right? So this is $4,592. So I don't need the cents at all. All right, so I'm going to get rid of the cents. I don't need those. This is um, 4,000, so this is the thousands, 500, right, and 90. So this is my tens place. So my, my dollar amount is 92, right? My tens is 92, and this is my one unit. So $92, what is that close to in terms of, is it close to 90 or 100? It's close to 90. So this is going to be, oops. That's going to be, so since it's close to $90, it's going to be $90. If it was close to, um, let's say it was 90, I don't know, 6. All right, so again, looking at just the tens, the tens of dollars, right? 96 is close to $100, so I would have $600. So it will be 600 like that. Okay, so 4590 is our answer. to the nearest $10. So be careful that it doesn't say 10th TH.
All right, let's just do another one. So you're not going to get anything compounded continuously. Let's do a compounded daily. All right, so again, we're going to start with the formula. All right, so let's do another question. This time we're compounding daily. All right, so Oliver invested this. So this is the initial amount. So that's your principal without the comma. Uh, to account paying an interest rate of 2.7 so 2.7 percent so remember we don't put percent into a formula we have to get rid of percent and how do i get rid of percent dividing by 100 so this is our interest rate so it goes where r is all right um compounded daily all right so how many days are there in a year 365 so this is n 365 and you have two of those so you're going to go up here as well and do 365 all right, assuming no deposit withdrawals were made, how much money to the nearest cent, so I need two numbers after decimal, would be in the account after 20 years. So time, so T is equal to 20, so times 20. Oh, careful. So when it does something like that, just come here and do it. So do, um, I'm going to do times 20 here, so that's on the top, and then I'm going to copy, let me try and copy and paste and see. Yep, all right, and then delete the rest of this. All right, so boom, I put everything in and I need the money to the nearest cent. So I need this number to the nearest cent. So hey, Mr. Calculator, I want you to round, parentheses, this number, comma, to the nearest cent. So cents is how many numbers? Two numbers. So two numbers after the decimal. All Right, find domain and range with technology. Again, we've covered domain and range um, extensively, but I'm just going to do another question because why not? Right, I'm going to put it in here so we can visually see it. Press home. That didn't, there's an error. I don't understand. Okay, so the calculator doesn't like the copy and paste of this, so I got to manually put it in. And you see how I just pressed that to see what the problem is? Um, so click pipe or absolute value. All right, in decimals, it doesn't like the copy and paste version. All right, so boom, what is the range? So again, what is range? Bottom to the top. So what's the bottom of this graph? The Y value, which is zero, to the top. What's the top? If I'm going up, I'm going to keep going up where? Forever. So this is to infinity. All right, so the bottom is zero. And we can write this one of uh, two ways. We can write Y is greater than or equal to zero. And let's just make sure that's what it's shaded. See? greater than right or equal to that's everything I want or and I wonder if it's going to the calculator is going to do this uh, closed closed because it includes zero to infinity um, maybe the calculator doesn't do this part I'm not sure where's infinity is that infinity here all right so the calculator is not going to do it in interval in set notation so this one would be zero to infinity but I'm going to do it on the answer just so I can show you that it's correct so I can say closed and then open because um, infinity is open and I'm going to start at zero close to open infinity so you can check it with the calculator in this notation but in set notation you you know you can check it All right so range range let's do a domain one not absolute value though let's do a different one range range domain there we go so again copy and paste so you can physically look at it uh, it's not letting me copy and paste I guess let's see control C see what it pastes oh, pretty much nothing okay so all right square root of and I paste that come out of it because if I do this this is not what this is, right? You see that? They're different. So I got to put this part outside. So control X, click outside, outside. All right, so that's what it is. And I'm looking for what? Domain. Domain is your X values, okay? So in terms of this notation, it's going to be X something, right? Greater than, equal to one of these with the number. Um, I'm going to hide it for right now. All right, so from the left side, where does this graph start? No graph, 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 graph. So right here right in terms of x it starts at negative two so anything to the right of negative two does it include negative two it does because that there's a point right there so anything to the right closed right because it includes it of negative two 
And you should see, so I'm gonna put home first. When I put the shade, it's gonna shade everything to the right this way. All right, so you can use that notation or you can use set notation, which means you're gonna start at negative two and then keep going this way. There's a graph where forever to infinity. So that's the one I'm gonna put in the calculator to show you that both are correct. So it's gonna be closed for negative two, open for infinity. So closed and open, negative two is closed and then positive infinity because it's going forever to the right. All right, so that's range and domain or domain and range. All right, evaluate a function from a graph. All right, so you're looking at the graph. Remember, so you see this is f, and then you see x, right? So that means this is also x. So x is equal to negative 3. What is the graph equal to when x is equal to negative 3? So when x is equal to negative 3, the graph says that it's equal to negative 6. All right, we'll do another one. It's trying to look for a positive one. Oh, but good, they changed the graph too. So that's cool. Okay, let's do this one. So when x is equal to 7, so I'm going to go where x is equal to 7. So x is equal to 7 here. Go to the graph. Boom, boom, negative 3. All right, now that we've done um, all the functions, linear, quadratic, and exponential, let's compare them. How, looking at a table, how would I know if this table is linear, quadratic, or exponential? Linear is, is a constant rate of change. You're adding and subtracting the same number. Quadratic is the second difference is the same. Exponential, you're multiplying by some number to get to the next one. Now, if you don't know what that means or don't know how to work it, it's very simple. Let's put this table in. Let's put the question in um, the calculator. So this is 0, enter, 1, enter, so up to 4. And then this is negative 6. And again, whenever you're copying the question, please make sure that you double check to make sure that you copied it correctly, because that's going to be the biggest mistake. 4, 2, 9. 7, 5, 8. All right, so let's look at what we have. So I'm going to click Home. Actually, I'm going to click Zoom Fit so that it can fit the points. This looks weird. There's a point that looks like that's off, right? So let's go double check our table like I said we should be doing and didn't do myself. Oh, it's negative right here. Double check, please. All right, so what does this look like? It doesn't look linear. This looks like quadratic, like it's like this, quadratic. Right, but to be sure, okay, so I don't know exactly what it is. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in all three of these. Okay, so I'm gonna go to my um trusted formula sheet. All right, so I'm gonna click reference so that I can get the formula sheet. And I'm looking for all three, so I need linear, so that's gonna be this one. Pity I can't copy and paste, but y equals mx plus b. Uh, quadratic, so looking for quadratic, oh, right here, quadratic formula, quadratic equation, um, always standard form, so y equals, uh, right here, ax squared plus bx plus c, so that's quadratic standard form, and exponential, y equals abx. Okay, so once I have all three of those, go back to my question. All right, once I have all three of those, I want to know which one of these is going to hit every single point. Okay, so if I'm thinking that it's um, linear, I'm going to put. Oh, actually, I'm not going to do that. All that. All right, if I think that it's linear. I'm going to change this to um, x1, y1, right, so that it can start appearing. And what's the other thing I need to change? This equal sign to the telda, I think it's called, but we'll call it the squiggly line. So I'll change that to the squiggly line. So that's what you get. Okay, so m is equal to negative 188. So where I see m, I'm going to put negative 188, and b is equal to 88. So where I see b, I'm going to put that. 
I'm going to delete the extra things I have. So it's the green line is linear. So if I look at this, does the green line go through? It has to go through every single dot. So it's not line of best fit. It has to go through every dot. So it doesn't. It doesn't go through every dot. So that's not it. So now I'm going to try the quadratic one. All right. So it's just pressing enter and deleting all that extra. Try the quadratic one. Come back to the quadratic. And actually, I don't even need all that. Change. Um, again, I need x1, y1 on quadratic. So 1. Uh, come down to the x1 another x1, and then squiggly line. Okay, so I have a is negative 41, negative 47. b is equal to 0. c is equal to negative 6. All right, get rid of that, okay? And now I'm looking at the blue line. Did it go through every single dot? So I'm going to oh, maybe not do that, but let me go back to zoom fit, zoom fit. Did it go through every single dot? Exactly, it did. So this one is um, quadratic. All right, I'm going to hide that for a second and come right here. I'm going to copy this again. Change my Y to 1, my X to 1, and then squiggly line. I'm just going to prove to you that it's not exponential, so squiggly line. All right, and then my A is this, so copy this and put it where your A is. Then copy your B and put it where B is. Delete the extra thing. So does exponential, so it does go through one line and maybe a second one, but does it go through all of them? No. So the perfect fit out of all these options, right, is that blue line so that blue line is my answer so let's go back and see what the question is actually asking this function is quadratic and why so you have to know why right so linear remember your first difference is the same quadratic your second difference is the same and um exponential your ratio you're multiplying by the same ratio so this is quadratic so it has to be second differences remember i'm showing you how to put it in the calculator not how to do it offhand identified quad and linear systems or solutions um, these are pretty straightforward remember that anytime you have anytime you have um, a system of equations the solutions are the intersections where the lines cross each other so where does this quadratic cross this linear so it crosses right here that's a solution and this is a solution so there are two solutions in this case and every time you write a solution it has to be an x and then y. So my first solution is my x. So if you forget the x-axis is horizontal. Is you come down, that's negative one. And my y, my y-axis is vertical. You go to that, that's going to be one. That's my first one. My second solution is going to be my x value first. So I go to x right here. That's going to be three. And my y value between negative six and negative eight is negative seven. Okay, so remember, a, a solution to a system of equations is the intersection when you have an equal sign. All right, so just put that in, negative 1, 1. All right, it's not going to let me put it in, but I'll just get it wrong and show you. All right, so negative 1, 1, and 3, negative 7. Negative 1, 1, 3, negative 7. Okay, so the intersection is the solution. I compare the functions which of the following statements is true now this may um, change a question each time you still just have to know what the basics are so again we're going to stick this in the calculator just make sure it copies exactly how it should copy that does not look the same so we're just going to manually type it in um, shift 6 gives you the exponent all right so that's f of x and g of x is this let's see if this will copy uh, kind of sorter so we're just going to go ahead and type that in make sure now the biggest thing is this has to be typed in exactly as you see it so pay attention to detail <clears throat> all right which of the following statements are true so look at where x is i've put the number four and on g of x where x is i've put the number four so what am i going to go do look where x is and in parentheses right put the number four so it gives you an actual value. So over here, in parentheses, put the number 4. OK, 
Okay, so it doesn't like that probably because it doesn't like this multiplication. So let me go put a uh, multiplication from Desmos. So if you copy and paste, just be careful. Um, sometimes it doesn't like what you're copying from. All right, so this is F and this is G. So let's see what's true. Is F greater than G? Is this greater than this? No. Is it less than? No. Is it equal to? Yes, it is. All right, so you're just going to put this in the calculator and you're going to compare. And that's the thing about this comparing things is you're doing both of them at the same time. All these questions are similar, so I'm not going to do another one. Form doesn't matter. So I did um, factor before. Let me do vertex this time. Again, control C. And then control V. All right, then make sure it copied what it needs to copy. So go ahead and fix what needs to get fixed. Make sure, double check that it is what it is on there. It is. Now I'm looking for when it is increasing. All right, so if I start right here, what's happening to the graph? It is going up. It gets to the top, and then what happens? It starts going down. All right, so it's increasing, and I'll just mark this. So it's increasing in terms of like, it's increasing from here all the way to, oof all the way to there and what's that number it stops increasing here right and then all the way this way it's increasing because it's coming from negative infinity so this is from negative infinity which is open because that's not a number to whatever number this is here all right so if i zoom in on the vertex which is five so all the way to five it is increasing so negative infinity to positive five open and then closed negative infinity to positive 5 it is increasing if I was looking for when it was decreasing then it would be from 5 because it starts decreasing right here right from 5 and it goes down like this it decreases forever in this direction next example when is it decreasing so again doesn't matter which one you pick so you take the whatever equation you do pick um, I've already done one of these, but I'll do another one because I think you guys um, struggle with this one. Minus 49. All right, make sure you copy it, whatever it is. And it's when is it decreasing? So when is the graph going down? Again, the, I can't tell what the graph is doing, but if I press this home button. Oh, never mind. That didn't help me. I'm going to zoom out. Oh, I must have copied the graph wrong because that is not a quadratic. All right, x plus 1 squared is because I have this x plus 3. All right, perfect. All right, so when is it decreasing this time, okay? So when is it decreasing? So it's decreasing here, right? This is all going down. All right, so you're going to look in your x-axis as when is that happening. So from here, which direction am I coming from? Negative infinity all the way to whatever the vertex is over here. All right, so negative infinity to whatever the vertex is, which is 1. So negative infinity to 1 or everything less than under 1. Find an increasing and decreasing domain. So we just did this in the last one, but we'll go ahead and do it again um, just because I want to make sure that you're okay. All right, so when is it increasing? So it's increasing here up to where? Up to there. So where am I coming from? I'm coming from negative infinity. So this is where it's increasing, right? Up to here. It stops right here. All right, so come down to that number. It's negative 5, right? And I need everything below that. So I can, that, I can write that as an inequality with less everything less than negative 5, or I like using um, set notation. It's up to you. It doesn't matter. It's coming from negative infinity, so it's going to be an open and closed. So it's coming from negative infinity, and then it stops at negative 5, and we include that because it's shaded. Okay. So increasing or decreasing, it's just you're looking at where is the graph going up, where is it going down, and then you're writing in the x values for those points. All right, I must find all the intervals where it is negative. All right, so negative, so positive and negative. And again, from my notes, positive and negative, the only one that's not blacked out is factored form. So this is coming from factored form. All right, so let's go ahead and find factored form. So here's my equation. All right, now, from here, I already know that I can pull x-intercepts very quickly, right? So let me pull my x-intercepts. So my x-intercepts are negative 5 and positive 1. All right, now, picture whether this is happy or sad. This is sad. All right, so it looks like this. So the graph looks like this, and it crosses the x-axis at negative 5. So this is the point right here, negative 5. 
this is the point positive one. And so that means this is zero, one, two, three, four, five. All right. So it crosses the x axis, right, at negative five and one. Now the question is when is this graph negative? In other words, when is it below? When it's below the x axis, it is negative. So over here and over here. When it is above, it is positive. So I'm actually going to do both questions here um, mm -hmm. just to make sure that I've covered both. So I'm going to do positive. So it's positive when it's above, so from here. And then it's negative when it is below, so here. Now it's just a matter of how to write that, okay? So I'll start with the actual question, which is negative. All right, so when is it negative? It's negative anywhere to the left of negative 5. All right, so to the left of negative 5, left of negative 5. When x is left of negative 5, it's negative. But it's also negative right here, all right, which is to the right of positive 1. So it's negative here and here, okay? Now I'm going to go ahead and do the positive. When is it positive? It is positive from here, from negative 5, all the way to positive 1. So when x is between negative 5 and positive 1, it is above the x-axis. So it is below here and here, and it is above here, okay? So that's how you do positive and negative. So x is less than negative 5, x is greater than positive 1. x is less than negative 5 um, or x is greater than positive 1. Okay, so that's how you do both, you know, positive and negative. All right, so we're looking at appropriate domain for real world problems. Um, there's no telling what you're going to get. So again, look at all these options. Um, it doesn't really matter. It's just a matter of whether it makes sense or not. So I'll pick the first one, but again, I'm not gonna do a whole bunch of questions. It's just a matter of whether it makes sense, okay? So um, you do need to know these definitions. Um, I'm gonna put them here for us answering our questions, but you do need to know what these definitions are. All right, so an object is launched off the top of the building. So it goes up. Actually, it's launched over here. So say this is the bottom right here. This is the top. It's launched. It goes up and then comes back down. All right, represents the height of the object above the ground, x seconds after being launched. So x is seconds and y is height. That's what you need to know. Find and interpret the given function values and determine an appropriate domain for the function. So what is f of negative 2? And we just did this in the last problem. Where I see negative 2, what's over here? x. So I'm going to replace everything every time I see an x with negative 2. So we're going to go ahead and pull up the calculator. Again, we're going to try copy, control C, and paste, control V. And just make sure that it does look like what it's supposed to. So control X, control V. And then I just need a squared right here. Double check to make sure it's exactly copied down correctly, which it is. And now we're going to go ahead and do this. We're replacing X with negative 2 because it's right there. So ever I see X in parentheses, all right, so ever I see X in parentheses, you are going to replace it with negative 2. All right, so as a matter of fact, I'm just going to copy the parentheses, control C, and everywhere I see an X, replace it with negative 2. All right, so I'm going to get 0. So when I evaluate this function, my height is 0. So after negative 2 seconds, my height is 0. So meaning that at negative 2 seconds, because that's what X is, right? X is seconds. So what did I put in? X was negative 2, right? After the object is launched, the object was zero feet above the ground. Does this make sense? Have you ever heard of, yeah, she ran negative two, mi negative two miles, or she ran, the time was negative 10 seconds. What? That does not make sense. You cannot have negative time. Can I have zero height? I can, right? I didn't go up or down, right? I can have zero height, right? But it does not make sense for my um, x to be negative. All right, let's go ahead and do 0.5, so that means everywhere I see an x, I'm putting 0 0.5, so I don't even have to come change anything, I'm just going to come right here, and put 0 0.5 where everywhere I had an x before. <clears throat> now it's 100, so what does this mean? At 0 0.5 seconds, I'm at 100 height. So this is equal to 100, right? Meaning that after 0 0.5 seconds, after the object is launched, the object was 100 feet, above the ground. Does this make sense? So now you're just looking at the two numbers. 
Is it okay to have half a second? Absolutely. Is it okay to have a hundred feet above? Can I have a hundred feet above the ground? Absolutely. So that makes sense. All right, f of five, that means everywhere I see x, I'm gonna replace it with five. That means everywhere I see x, oh, I should not do it that way, sorry. Everywhere I see x, which is the parentheses, I'm gonna replace it with five. All right, so this is saying, all right, so f of five is equal to negative 224. Meaning that five seconds, because that's x, right? Five seconds after the object was launched, the object was negative 224 feet above the ground. Does this make sense? All right, so let's look at the seconds. Can I have five seconds to do something? Yes, I can. Can I be minus 224 below ground? Now, if this was talking about maybe a drill, and, and so again, this is why I said real world problems, are, you have to think about what the question is asking. If this was a drill drilling underground, sure, I could have negative 224. But this is an object that's launched above on top of the building, like a ball or something that's thrown off a building. Once it goes to the ground, what's it going to do? Is it going to start drilling itself now? No, it's not. So it can have negative height. But if the question has said, hey, I am drilling into the ground with this machine or whatever, and it goes into the ground, then sure. But right now, whatever object was thrown above, even if it's a bomb, it's not going to go negative 224 feet below. So this does not make sense. All right, based on this observation, it's clear that an appropriate domain of the function is. All right, so this is where our definitions come from. So looking at what we have, can I have, because it's domain, I'm only looking at my x values. That means I'm only looking at these numbers right here, okay? I'm not looking at my y. If it was asking me about range, I would look at my y. But right now, I'm looking at my x. Can I have negative 10, negative 2 as a time? No. So that means... I cannot include negative numbers. So let's see what all real numbers is. Everything you can think of. So that's no. Non-negative real numbers. Everything you can think of that's positive, maybe. Real numbers between two points, maybe. Whole numbers, a number is simply a positive number, maybe. Integers, a number with no decimal, a fractional part or set of negative and positive number, not negative, so not that one. Positive integers, maybe. Integers between two points, maybe. So we got rid of two. All right, now we're looking at this one. Can I have 0 0.5 seconds that we talked about that we could? So I'm not looking at whole numbers or integers now. So let's look at our definitions again. So we got rid of that. Everything you can think of that's positive, maybe. Real numbers between only two points, maybe. We're going to leave that alone. Um, whole number, any positive numbers not include a fractional or decimal part. So no, this is gone. So now I'm on just these two. And over here, this one was gone whole numbers not including zero this one is gone number with no decimal with no decimal this one's gone all right so i'm down to two options these two right here so the question is right um non-negative real numbers everything you can think of that's positive so let's think about is there a maximum like if i take this equation let me put my x back real quick does it go on forever because that means time is forever right so let me make this bigger let's go ahead and home it uh, maybe zoom out a little bit. Now, of course, Desmos is graphing the whole thing, but think about it as a real-world problem. What did the question say? The question said, hey, I was standing on top of the building, which is right here. Looks like the building is 96 at zero time. I haven't thrown the ball or whatever object I'm throwing. 96 high. I throw the ball or whatever I'm throwing up and then down. Does it make sense that once this hits the ground, and where does it hit the ground? Where you cross the x-axis right here because what's the height here zero so it cannot go below here all right look at the time can it go past three seconds then no because at that point it's already hit the ground which means there's a constraint your domain is from zero to three and actually when you get these real world problems you can put it in the calculator and just look at it but you can't say oh it's all real numbers because it's a real world problem it's a start and an end you can have negative time but so you can start right here and you can't have um, negative height so it has to end right here so your domain is from zero to three included so let's go see what that is zero to three included and so that is everything you can think of between two points yes everything you can think of that's positive no because you can't pass three so this one is going to be real numbers in a b and that starts from zero to three 
So with real world problems, you really need to like read it and understand what it is asking. So definitely give it a two once over, read it twice so you can see. All right, so transform functions. Okay, so remember before you can apply the rules, you must know the rules, all right? So you do need to pull up your notebook once again. So on transformations, and really what you care about is this two um, boxes right here. Oops, I, I didn't hope to do that. So these two boxes is all that you need to look at. So you need to ask yourself these, the first question, is it inside, outside, or is it a negative? Okay, is it inside, outside, or is it a negative? So let's see if I can kind of have both of this up there. Move this over here. Okay. All right, is it, so is it inside, outside, or is it a negative? So I'm looking here. So my function is related to the X. So right now I have something outside and I also have something inside. So let's deal with this three first, okay? This is outside. So I answer, oh, it's outside. All right, so outside is Y and regular. Outside is Y and regular. So it's the Y axis. It's got to do with something going up and down. And it's whatever you think. All right, so keep this in mind. Now you ask yourself the second question, okay? Is whatever is outside, are you adding or subtracting it? No. Am I multiplying it? Yes. So if I'm multiplying it, it is either a stretch if it's a whole number or a shrink if it's a fraction in the X or the Y direction because I already know it's um, outside, it's Y. So this is a stretch because it's a whole number in the Y direction. And it is exactly what I think because it's Y and regular. So it's going to stretch in the Y direction by three. So I'm going to look at any point I want, this one, this one, this one, doesn't matter. And I'm going to stretch it by three. So multiply one by three, this point, I stretch it from one to three. Or I can stretch this one. This one's at two. Two times three is six. I can stretch this one to six. You see how it's still the three and not the six? It doesn't matter which one you pick. This one is at three. So stretching that times three will take me to nine. And again, that's the exact same points. One times three was three. Um, two times three was six. And three times three is nine. So it doesn't matter which point you pick as long as you're stretching it um, in the Y direction by three. All right, so that's this point right here. Now I'm going to look at the inside. In the inside, what do I have? I have minus five. So again, I go back to my notes and I ask one of these questions, okay? Is it inside, outside, or is it a negative? It's inside, right? So inside is X and opposite. So you need to keep that in mind. All right, then I go to the second question. Am I adding or subtracting? I am. I'm subtracting it, right? Um, subtracting is a shift. So you're moving, okay? You're shifting. All right, and then keep in mind the X direction is either going to be, look at the X axis, you're either going to go right or you're going to go left. And it's going to be opposite of what you think. Okay, so looking at this negative 5, I would think to go to negative 5 is left, but it's going to be opposite of what I think, so move to the right. So you're going to move to the right 5, and that's all you have to do. So once you know the, once you know the transformation rules, you just need to apply them to a graph. Then you submit your answer. So I am going to do a few more of these just to make sure um, we're fine. It doesn't matter what graph they give you. So find your x, that's the function, look at everything else. So I have two things, I have this negative outside and I have this one third outside as well. All right, so I'm gonna start with this negative. I'm gonna ask these questions. Is it inside, outside, or is it a negative? It's a negative. All right, negative is opposite no matter what. So keep that in mind. Then you go to this. Is it adding and subtracting? Nope. Are you multiplying? Nope. It's a negative. Negatives are flips over the x and the y axis. And we just said it's opposite no matter what. So it's flipping opposite of what you think. Okay, so let's go to this. It's outside. I would think it's Y and regular, but it's going to be opposite. So instead of it flipping over the Y axis, like I would think, it's going to flip over the X axis. If you're having problems with any of these transformation rules, go and do the transformation rules first and then come and apply it. So I'm going to flip it over the X. That means take any point and move it completely in the opposite direction over the X. So this is one. So it goes to one right there. And again, you can take any point. This one is one, two. So I'm going to go one, two. You can take any point at all. Three is going to go down to three. Okay? So it does not matter what point. You're just flipping it over the x-axis. So that's done. Now I'm going to look at this fraction of a third. So again, I come back to my notes. Inside, outside, or negative? Well, we're just dealing with outside. 
It's why and what you think, okay? Whatever you think it is, it's in the y direction. All right, are you adding, subtracting it? No. Multiplying, yes. All right, stretching is a whole number. Shrinking is a fraction. So what is it? A fraction. So I think I'm supposed to shrink it. And again, outside is y and what I think. So it is shrinking. So I'm shrinking it by a third. Now multiplying a number by a fraction by one third is the same as just dividing by three. So on this equation, I'm just going to divide by three. So I'm going to shrink each point by three. So I'm just dividing by three. Now, if I take negative 4 and divide it by 3, it's not going to give me a nice number. But if I take negative 3 and divide by 3, it's going to give me negative 1. So this negative 3 is going to shrink in the y direction to negative 1. All right, I'm going to get the next one wrong just so I can get more questions because I know we need them. All right, as a matter of fact, I'm going to do ones that we haven't done. So we, we did absolute value as the... In fact, let's do this one. All right, cool. All right, so again, find the x. That's your function. All right, I have a third outside. We just talked about this on the last question. All right, a third outside. Outside is y and regular. A third is multiplication. Shrink is a fraction. Stretch is a whole number. So shrink, y, and what I think. Okay, regular. So I'm going to take something that's divisible by 3, like the number 3. 3 divided by 3 is going to give me 1. So I'm going to shrink it in the y direction. Then what does a plus four outside do? All right, so let's see. Outside is y and reg outside is y and regular. Plus and minus is a shift, right? So because I'm shifting in the y direction, I'm either going to go up or I'm going to do it down. And it's because whatever it is that I'm thinking, right? So plus four in the y-axis, plus four is over here. And it's supposed to be what I'm thinking. So this is going to shift up by four. Again, if you're having problems with the function rules, you need to go do the work for the function rules before you apply it. Okay, and that's all you're doing. All right, let me do just maybe a couple more. Again, doesn't matter what it is. Find your x, so here's my x. All right, negative 5 inside, okay, so inside, x and opposite. I'm going to get a little faster now because we've done it over and over. x and opposite, and then adding and subtracting is a shift, okay? x, x direction, so it's this way or this way, right or left, and opposite of what you think. Negative 5, I would think go this way, but I'm really going to go this way. So I'm going to shift it. 5 to the right. Plus 3, outside, okay? Adding and subtracting is still a shift. So outside is 1 regular. So whatever I think. So I think in the y direction, plus 3 is going to take it up. 3. And that's all you're doing. All right, I'm going to get a couple more wrong just so I can just do a few more. All right? Doesn't matter what the function is. So find your x. Here's my function right here. The only thing that's happening to this is there's a 4 outside. What does a 4 outside do? So outside is y and regular. Is it adding and subtracting? No, it's multiplication. Whole numbers are stretches, okay? So this, I would think, is stretching, and because it's outside, it's y and what I think. So stretch by 4 in the y direction. So take any number and multiply it by 4. So 1 times 4 or 2 times 4, doesn't matter. 1 times 4 is 4, stretching it in the y direction. All right, uh, I think we just did this one, but anyway, inside, x and opposite, so instead of going left to, I'm going to go right to. Outside, y and regular, so instead of going uh, y and regular, so whatever I think is in the y direction, so that's going to be down three. All right, it looks like I'm on my last question. Um, a half on the outside is y and regular, a half is a shrink, and what I think it's going to do is just going to, it's going to do that. So it's going to shrink it by a half. So multiply these numbers by half or divide by 2. It doesn't matter. So 4 divided by 2 will give me 2. All right, we did negative and positive. I'll do another question of this just to make sure. All right, so we just did this, but we won't do this again. So again, it was factored form, okay? From factored form, we're going to get our x-intercepts and whether it's a minimum or maximum. So let's look at the question. All right, so my it is a sad face. My x-intercepts are opposite positive 2 or um, positive 6 so I'm going to go ahead and draw it with the x-axis it crosses at 2 and 6 so this is 2 this is 6 okay this is the x-axis all right remember it is positive above the x-axis and it is negative below 
the x-axis. So depending on which one they want. So they want, um, when is it positive? So it's positive between here and here. So it's positive when x is between 2 and 6. I'll go ahead and do a negative just um, in case. So it's negative to the left of 2, left of 2, or to the right of 2, of, of um, sorry, 6, to the right of 6. So if I asked you for the negatives, it'll be these two. If I asked you for the positives, it'll be this. So x is between 2 and 6 for the positives. So x is between 2, so x is between 2 and 6. All right, so right translated function. So again, if you know your translation rules, this makes it very, very simple. You do have to know what the parent graph is. So what is this one? Um, is cubed, or they tell you in the question that's even perfect. It's cubed. Um, you could get a whole bunch of them. What's this one? Quadratic, and again, it tells you in the question. Um, what's this one? It's a V, right? Here's a V, that's absolute function. So you could get a whole bunch. <clears throat> the important thing is to know what it is, okay? So let's read what the question is saying. The graph f of x is negative, again, because I can see it flipped, so that makes sense. Write the equation of the function, which would take it up three units. Oh, okay. So all this means is you start with the original function, and what does it mean to take it up three? It needs to be outside, right? Outside, and it's y and regular, so it should be negative x plus three. I'm not going to type this in for time so I can show you like a whole bunch, but I am going to show you solution. So here it is, whatever it is, and then plus three. Oh, wait, did I not did I read this uh, shift up? What did I read? Left. Okay, clearly I misread that. Okay, so if it was up, it would be um, plus three on the outside, but it's left, all right, which means you're inside, which is opposite of whatever you think. You think left is minus, so it'll be plus. See that? All right, I'm going to do a whole bunch of these, so um, I'm not actually going to put the question in. We're just going to do them, okay? All right, so let me show a question. What are we doing? We're li moving left, and I'm going to read it. Left one unit. That means this is my parent. For my parent one is this right here. So inside the parentheses, inside the parentheses, I'm putting one right here where the blue is. I'm going to move it left. So left is minus, but it's opposite of what I think because it's inside. So it's going to be plus one. So show it in solution. So 2x plus one inside. Okay. And again, I'm just going to do, in fact, let me do one of everything. Here's a cubic one. Identify what the parent, okay, these are too many lefts. Let me find something else. Okay, let's do a right one. All right, so here's a cubic function. So identify what the parent is, cubed. So the parentheses is going to be right here where the blue is. And now we're moving right four units. Right is inside the parentheses, x and opposite. So you think right is plus, so it's really minus. So inside the parentheses here should be minus four. Everything else staying the same. And the way you would do this in, um, in Desmos is you would put the answer choice. So you'd put the question and the answer and just see did it move to the right like they're showing you for spaces. All right, let me do another one, square root. All right, so square root, um, we just did a right one, let's do something else. All right, down, this is outside, right? Out y and regular, so this should be outside your parent graph. And where is, what is your parent graph, right? This is uh, an exponential function, so you know that x is raised to the power, so this right here, right, within here would be your parentheses. So I want to move it down five units. So that will be outside your parentheses. You want to move it down five units. Okay, and again, all right, see, outside your parentheses, which would be right there, you're moving it five units. Again, all you would do is put in your question and your answer choice if it's multiple choice and see which one moves it down five units. All right, one more. We did, oh, we've done all of them. I'll just do one more just to see. Down one, we did that one. Okay, up two, we haven't done this one. All right, so again, here's my parent function square root. I don't think I did this one. Here's my parent function square root. It's not letting me highlight. So inside your square root are your parentheses. All right, and you're moving it up two units, so that's y and regular. So this is all the way outside. So not in here, but outside plus two. All right, so outside plus two. All right, so again, they're showing you how it's moving here. If you put your question and your answer, you'll see this graph, then this graph, which is obvious that this has moved up. Okay, a thousand different kind of questions that you can get for this compare ones. Um, so it really doesn't matter if I do one or two. It's just a matter of you reading and understanding the question. So 
Ask the questions based on the graph of the function f of x and the table of g of x. So here are my two functions. And the question is, what is happening in the y-intercepts? All right, so again, there's just no way of knowing what question they can ask you. If it's a graph, you can easily see what's the y-intercept here, negative 5. Okay, what's the y-intercept from a table? If you don't know that the y-intercept right here happens when x is equal to 0, so when I go look at x equals 0, it's going to be negative 6, it's a matter of you knowing how to input the table. So let me just show you how to input the table just so that we are all clear. So this is negative 4, um, 2, negative 3, 0, negative 2, negative 2, negative 1, negative 4, 0, negative 6, 1, negative 8. All right, so here is the table. Now, it looks linear to me, so guess which equation I'm going to look first. Uh, we can click this to zoom fit it. Um, I'm going to check y equals mx plus uh, mx plus b. Again, two things you need to change in Desmos. You need to put the 1, well, is it 1? It is 1 and 1, so 1 after the x and y, and you need to put it in the squiggly line. As long as it goes through all points, you know that that is exactly what it is. So does it go through all points? Yes, it does. So this is actually the equation, which is, I'm just going to copy this real quick without the squiggly line and without all of that. So this is y equals mx. m is negative 2, so we're going to put negative 2. And b is negative 6. All right, so this is my equation. All right, where is the y-intercept? So we're going to come see where it crosses the y-intercept, and you can see that it crosses a negative 6. So it's a lot faster if you know how to read a table, but if you don't know how to read a table, that's definitely how you put it into the calculator. And so what was the question? The y-intercept of f of x is, so which one is which? This is f of x, so negative 5 is greater. Oh, you, they're just answering what it is. Okay, cool. Uh, negative 5 is, so f of x is negative 5. G of x is negative 6. Therefore, f of x has a what? Greater, be careful with negative numbers, okay? It goes negative 10, negative 9, negative 8, negative 7, negative 6, negative 5. So everything to the right is greater, so that's greater than. All right, but again, like I said, there could be a trillion answers they could ask out of this. So you can see that one was y-intercept. This one is x-intercept. So Where does it cross the x-axis? All right, so I'm just going to talk about it. Um, this one is y-intercepts. Let's see what else you can get. So, oh, x, y-intercepts, maximum or minimum. So, again, all you have to be able to do is read the graph. And for maximum and minimum, remember from your table, again, you can put it in the calculator and you can see it. But um, what you want to do is you want to find the pattern. So here's the pattern right here. See how it goes negative 8? right there, and then negative 17, right there, then negative 32, right there. Your vertex is going to happen in between that, so it's most likely to negative 5. But again, all you got to do is put the table in Desmos and then look at it and see what the maximum value is. All right. Distinguish between those two. So are you adding and subtracting, or are you um, multiplying each time? So looking from 3 to 12, and my multiplying looks like times 4. If I do 12 times 4, will I get 48? I don't know. Let me check. All right, so 12 divided by, so second number divided by the first. And then the second number subtract from the first. All right, so it could either be a multiplying by 4 or I'm adding 9, one of the two. So let's check. If I do 3 times 4. I get 12. If I do times 4 again, do I get 48? I do. Whereas this one, I get, I'm adding 9, right? So this one is saying 3 plus 9. I get the next number 12. But if I add 9 again, do I get 36? I don't. So this one is geometric. And the sequence is a common ratio. And it's equal to, what was I multiplying by? 4. Okay, so once you decide which one it is, you answer the questions. All right. Uh, select recursive formula. So again, we're working backwards. Okay, what this one is saying, which recursive would produce this sequence? So they tell you that the first one, the first term is 3. And then they're asking you in general what happens. So let me go over 
because this one's not really a calculator, it's just understanding. This is saying this. When I do say, so they say the first one is that one, right? So now I'm looking at the second one. So this is the second term. So when I take the second term, when I'm looking for the, the second one, and then I subtract one to it, I'm going to get the first term. So what this is saying is, is negative two times whatever the first one was, which is this, then minus three, is that going to give you three? That's the question. Okay, so I'll put that in the calculator. So I have a negative two, and again, I'll do the same thing for all of them. Negative two, and I'll leave this part blank because that's what my substitution is, and then three. As a matter of fact, can I, just kind of gonna go four times and then change it. All right, the second one is negative five, and then minus two. Third one is negative three, minus two. And the last one is negative 2 minus 5. All right, so what it's saying is when I put the term before it, right, that's what this is. Put the term before it, do I get the next one? So they give you the first one. The first term is 3, so you see all of this is 3, right? So when I put in that first term, so when I put in 3, do I get the next term? So I should get, when I put in 3, I should get the next term, which is negative 11. Which one of that gives me that? So these last two. So now I'm looking at these two. When I put in the term, so now I'm on A2, right? A2 is now 11. So when I put in that term and do this to it, do I get 17? So now when I put in the next term, which is negative 11, so right here, because these are the only two that are working so far. So negative 11 and negative 11. Do I get the next one, which is 17? Only on the last equation. Okay, so I'm going to say that again because it actually I'm going to do a, a different example. Uh, let's see, let me get this wrong so I can do another one. So, yep, it was the last one. Um, I just want to do another problem again. So, I'm going to copy down what it is. So, with parentheses where the previous term is. So, this one is four, this one is plus four, this one is two and three. We might as well delete all of this. And this one is 4 and negative 4. This one is 3 and positive 2. All right, so same thing as before. When I, uh, if I'm looking for the second term, when a is 2, um, 2 minus 1 will give me 1. So this is negative 4 times the first term plus 4. Okay, that's what that's how that reads. So when I look at it, when I put in the first one, which is 6, so I'm put the first one, 6, do I get 20? That's the question. Okay, so 6, 6, 6, and 6. I only get 20 on the last two. So it's not A, it's not A, and it's not B. So it's one of these two. Now it's saying when I put 20 in there, will I get 76? That's what that is. So I only need to do it on the last two. So when I put 20, oops, 20, which one gives me 76C? So this is your answer. Just that easy. All right, select an explicit formula. So remember we talked about how we're just going to use the multiple choice so these are test taking skills, which is going to use the multiple choice to see what it is instead of doing it from scratch. So the question is, what is the formula for the nth term of the given sequence? So these are all the different formulas. The thing to remember about um, these formulas is that n is the number of terms. So this one is the first term, this one is the second, this one is the third, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? So what you're asking yourself to do is when n is one, all right, when I put one there. Will the term that I get out be 4? So if I put 1 where I see n, will it be 4? So what you can do in terms of um, putting this in Desmos is you can just copy the right-hand side of each equation for every single one. Because this we're doing multiple choice, right? For every single one so that I know which one the answer is. And I'll copy them in order so I can keep the answer the same. All right, and then this is to the power, so make sure you fix it to the power of four. All right, so those are my four answer choices. And now I'm going to say when n is 1, do I get 4? So I come right here, and I do 1. Did I get 4? I did. 
All right, what about the second term? So if I put the second one, will I get one? So if I put two, do I get one? I do. And if I put three, do I get negative two? I don't. Okay, so A is not the answer. So now I'm going to check B, wherever I see N. Put it in parentheses. I'm going to put the first term. Do I get four? I don't, so it's not that one. I'm going to go to C, put parentheses for where N is. So that's what I'm doing. Put in parentheses where N is and put in one, two, and three, and do I get these numbers? So one, do I get four? I do. Two. Do I get, no, I, I need to get one, not seven. So the answer must be this last one, but I'm going to check. So again, where n is, you're going to put parentheses, and then you're going to put it on. Okay, so when n is one, I get four. When I put the second one, do I get one? I do not. Okay, so that wasn't the answer, so I must have made a mistake. And it looks like, why did I put negative two here? It must have been two. All right, so I'm going to check again. So if it's one it's four. If it's two, is it one? Yes. And if it's three, it's negative two. So the answer is actually A. I'm tripping. So remember, all right, this is, N is just the, the number of terms. So this is the first one, the second one, and the third one. So when you substitute the first term, the first one, do I get four as the answer? When I substitute this for the second one, do I get one as the answer? When I put the third one, do I get negative two? Okay, that's really all that you're doing. And then once you do that, you match it up. Okay, so just make sure that you um, actually read the question to see what the question is asking, and then you should be good. All right, create a box plot. All right, so we're just going to use the calculator. We're going to copy. And how do I put in, because if I just paste it, oh, wait, something's up because it's giving me an error. Lists are written like this also, you, you mean it has to have a bracket. So let's go ahead and put a, um, a closed bracket, boom. Oh, look at that. All right, so there are 15 elements. I'm just gonna make sure I copied all of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, I did. All right, now here's the thing though. If I don't name this list, when I come here and I go functions and I'm trying to go to the min, I don't know how to reference it. So for that reason, you have to give it a letter. So I'm going to say A equals. That way I can say, what is the minimum of this data set A? And that's going to be 2. All right, what is the first quartile? How do I put in quartile? Now, remember, be careful. Quantile is different from quartile. So quartile. How do I put in the first quartile? Let's see if this works. 1, I want quartile 1 of data set A. Oh, it's not that way. It's quartile A of... Um, quartile from from set A, give me quartile one. That's four. <clears throat> All right, median, you can say quartile again, or you can say median. It doesn't matter. So if you are saying quartile, it'll be quartile two. All right, so medium of data set A is seven. Quartile three, so quartile, quartile three, A, comma, three, 15. And the maximum is 17, but I'm just going to use a calculator anyway. Maximum of A is 17. Once I have that to create the box plot, you just drag it to that. So the minimum that this can be in is 2. So drag this to 2. First quartile to 4. Med median to 7. So just dragging it. 15 on quartile 3. And maximum is 17. So this is what the box plot looks like. All right, center and spread visually. Okay, so we can actually calculate this, um, you know, or actually if it's true or not, but we can do it visually really quickly. So we have two data sets, right? Where would you think the center of this would be of each data set? So let me go ahead and just um, take a picture of this. All right, so looking at this data it goes from here to here where would the middle if you would find the middle where would that be i would say it would be roughly 29 30 31 where would the middle of this one be so it's coming from here all the way to here um most of the data is on this side so i would say maybe 32 33 so that means the center of g is more than the center of that one what about the spread? Well, I just highlighted the spread right here. This is how spread out the data is. Whereas over here, it's definitely more spread out, right? So the spread is more for G. So center and spread is more for G. And that's what you're visually doing with each question. So the data set F is 
less than the center of data set G, the uh, spread of F is less than um, G. And I'm just going to do another one just in case you didn't quite catch that explanation. All right, so again, doing it here, we know center is the median is this line right here. This is 29. And this line right here is 32. So W is less than X. W is less than X. How about how it's spread? All right, so spread is actually um, Q3 minus Q1. So that's going to give you how wide is the box right here. This one is less wide than this one. So less. And again, um, I'm going to get it wrong just so that I can do another question. So, and you see, you can actually find out exactly what the median is and the IQR, which is Q3 minus Q1. Um, but we're just doing this visually, so less and less. It's a lot faster to do it visually than to actually work it out. All right, so I'll do one more. All right, good, it gave me something completely different. All right, so center, center of this, I'd say 26, 27. Center of this is 22, so Y is more, greater. All right, how spread out is the data? This is less spread out than this one, which is more spread out, so this is less. All right, so you're just visually looking at it. Of course, you can actually find it out for sure, but we're just visually looking at it. All right. <coughs> All right. Uh, interpret <clears throat> mixed representations. And I'm going to get these wrong so that um, I can do multiple. All right, so find the range. What is range? Large max minus min, so 114 minus the smallest number is 41. So 73, okay, I'm just going to get some of these wrong because there are multiple questions that they could ask you. So 73 would be what it is. All right, then we're going to go to, so again, different representations, right? Uh, what is this one asking? How many letters? Okay, this is what the graph, what is the range? Okay, so this is still the same. What's the max? Okay, so number of letters uh, is here, here's the max. So the maximum, um, Length is 10 minus the minimum length is 2. So that's going to be 8 is going to be my range. Again, I'm going to get it wrong so I can get some more. All right. Oh, uh, C solution. <clears throat> so again, my maximum letters is 10. My min is 2. So it's going to be 8. Uh, let's see what else they got. What is the most common score? What do you see happening the most is going to be 90 because this happens however many times this is the most. All right, I'll get that wrong so I can have some more. All right, so you see 90. Um, what, how many students made three posts? Okay, so this is the number of social media posts made. So three, so this. So how many students made three posts? Five. So honestly, this question is going to keep changing. You just need to know how to read um, the graph or the dot plot or the box and whisker plot. So I'll just do a few more just to make sure. How many students have the name that's longer than eight letters? So here's eight letters. Which ones are longer than eight letters? Just these three. Okay. Um, so again, I'm just going to get it wrong so I can get some more. So just understanding how to read the representation. All right. How many students take, so this one I'll actually get right. How many students take less than 40 minutes to get to school? So this is the amount of minutes. All right. 40 minutes is right here and it has to be less than, okay, less than less than here. So you just count everything that's less than here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. So 23 students are less than 40. So that means over here. Interpret two-way tables. All right. So how many students were surveyed? All right. So this is super, how many, how many students in the sixth grade like superhero movies? How many students in the sixth grade likes comedy? How many students in the sixth grade like drama? How many in the seventh likes superhero? How many in seventh likes comedy? How many in seventh likes drama? How many in eighth likes superhero? How many in eighth likes comedy? And how many in eighth likes drama? All right, so your totals... All right, so in some questions, they're going to give you the total, but sometimes they don't. So I can make a... a a total column here and a total com a total column here. All right, so how many students total in sixth grade? So 19 plus 14 plus 5. So that's going to give me 38. 20, 40, yep, 38. 
All right, how many in seventh grade? Adding all of these up, that's going to give me 33. How many in eighth grade? Adding all of these up, uh, 31, 41, 50. Let me do that again, 20, 30, 40, 50, yeah. All right, 50, um, adding all of those up. And then you can also add it up, up and down. So how many in total, regardless of what grade they're in, like superhero, so adding all of these up. I'm gonna have um, 30, 41, adding all of these up. How many like comedy? Uh, so five to four, 45. Add in how many like drama? So um, six, five, carry one, 35. All right, so those are the totals um, horizontally and vertically, but you can also have the total, um, total, total. How many students were surveyed? So this is gonna be 80, six, 86, 91, 120. Uh, I'm gonna do that again, uh, just to make sure. So uh, that's 10, 80, Why am I blanking? That that was wrong. So that's 11 carry 1, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Oh, so it's 121. All right, and then if you add this, it should also equal 121. So 38, 33, and 50. So that's going to be 1 carry 1, uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Yep, that works out. So 121. So just be careful when you're adding your totals. Obviously, you use a calculator if you're allowed to use a calculator. All right, now that you have your totals, you can add, you can answer any questions. How many students were surveyed? So how many total students were surveyed? 121. And I'm going to answer all the questions in this one question because I don't feel like adding all those numbers up again. All right, so 121 was surveyed. How many um, students like superhero movies? So I go superhero, 41 students. How many like comedy? 45. How many like drama? 35. How many total? Um, sixth graders are there? 38. How many seventh graders are there? 33. How many eighth graders are there? 50. Okay. How many eighth graders like comedy? How many eighth graders like comedy? 20. How many um, seventh graders like drama? Seventh graders, drama, 11. How many um, eighth graders like superhero movies. So eighth graders, superhero movies, 11, and so forth. So that's how you read the table. So regardless of what the question is, that's how you read it. So 121 was my total uh, number of students surveyed. So those will be all the kind of questions that they're going to ask you. All right, uh, correlation and association. Okay, so here's a scatter plot. What does this look like? So this looks like a negative linear uh, because they are generally decreasing. And let me show you what I mean by that. And I'm going to get that one wrong too so that I can make sure I can go over some examples for you. All right, so remember with scatter plots, you want to split the dots. So, you know, split the dots to the best of your ability. It looks like that, right? Even though this is an outline. All right, so it looks like it's going down. Okay, and that's why I'm saying it's a negative linear because it's decreasing. Why is it linear? Because it's a straight line. So if it was a quadratic, it would look like this or like this. And if it was exponential, it would look like that or uh, like this. Okay, all right, so those are the options. I'm going to get it wrong so that I can do some more. All right, actually, I'll just do one more because I think it's relatively simple. All right, so here's another one. So what does it look like? Is it a U, an N? It looks like if I split the dots, it would be just like this. So that's a linear again. And this time it's going up, so it's a positive linear. All right, so the scatter plot shows a positive linear um, with generally increasing. And oh, I did not notice. On that last one, it should have been a negative linear with one outlier right, because there was that weird one. But here, there's no outlier. So actually, I'm going to actually get this wrong and do it again. Let me find one, because that, that was actually a good question. Oh, it's not doing it now. Okay. Well, okay, what about this? It's everywhere. So this shows no relationship, no correlation, because the plotted of x increase and the y generally show no pattern. Okay, so that one I'm actually going to do. 
All right, so again, and this one would be negative with one outlier. So this would be a negative linear with, because this one is out there, right? So negative with one outliner because it's decreasing. All right, so again, just kind of graph it and see what it's doing. All right, correlation coefficient. Ooh, all right. So remember, really for correlation coefficient, um, I'm going to do it off the example. If it's completely straight and going down, it's negative 1. If it's, if it's completely straight and going up, it's positive 1. Really what it looks like is this. It goes from negative 1 to positive 1. The further, the closer it is to negative 1 and positive 1, the stronger the relationship. So the, uh, when r is equal to negative 1 or r is equal to um, 1, the stronger the relationship. If it's exactly negative 1, it means all the dots are perfectly straight. And that was not straight. If it's exactly positive 1, then all the dots are perfectly straight going up. But something close would mean that they are like dots on either sides, right? But if it's like weak, they're dots further apart. So that's what that means. When you look at something like this, you can't see any kind of relationship. That's no correlation. So again, the closer R is to negative 1 and positive 1, the stronger the relationship. The closer it is to 0, the weaker the relationship. Okay, so that's really all that you need to know. So this one shows... Uh, no correlation. Okay, but again, I'm just going to get some wrong so I can go through a few examples. <clears throat> this one also shows no correlation because I can't see anything, right? Oh, I don't mean to get that right. Sorry. So again, get that wrong. All right, so no correlation. All right, next, this is perfectly straight going down. So that's a negative, a strong, a perfect actually negative correlation. Why? Because it's perfectly straight. All right, perfect negative correlation. All right, next. All right, uh, this has a negative, a very weak negative. All right, and again, because they're, they're spread out from, like my line would be right here, and they're spread out from that. All right, this is a positive, a strong positive, because all the dots are very close to the line that I would make. Strong positive. Uh, I'll just do one more. This is a positive because I can see they're all going up, right? But I would say they're weak because they're really far apart. And I think that should be all of them. So weak, positive, weak, positive. Okay. All right. Last one. All right. So again, we talked about it in the last video. Remember, very close to 1 and negative 1, it would be... Um, very strong. So this one's asking strong positive. All right, so very close to one. Which number is closest but does not exceed one? So regression one is not it because that goes further than one, right? So this is negative. So between these two, which one is closest? Regression two. And again, I'm going to get a few wrong just to make sure you understand. So regression two is closest. All right, uh, which one is the weakest linear relationship? Okay, so weakest, remember, is closest to zero. Whether that's from negative or positive doesn't matter. So which number is closest to zero? So if I was to put this on a number line, um, I'll just do this real quick. If I was to make a number line, all right, where this is zero, this is negative one, and this is positive one. All right, and I would put the points, <clears throat> so negative 0 0.98 is going to be very close to, and actually I'll color code this so that I know. So this is green, very close to negative 1, right? Uh, negative 8, so let me color code this blue, okay? Negative 0 0.8, it's, it's not as close as this one, so somewhere over here, okay? Next one, let me code this one brown. Uh, negative 0 0.3, so that's closer to here. And then let me code this one whatever color that is, this negative eight, seven. So this one's closer than that, so it's over here. Which one is closest to either negative one or positive one? It's gonna be this green dot, which is this, okay? And that's how you're doing it. So which one is closest to positive and negative one? So from here on out, I'll just um, do it. So again, that's gonna be regression one. Oh, I need to get it wrong so I can do a couple. Ooh, regression three, what did I miss? Regression three. Oh, was it weak? Oh, y'all, please read the question. Okay, so which one has the weakest, okay? So going back to my number line, my bad. Please read the question. The weakest one is the brown one. 
0 0.35. So that's going to be regression 3. So make sure you do read the question. All right, which is going to be the strongest? Positive. So I'm looking the closest to positive 1. So not these negatives. Closest to positive 1 is going to be regression 3. This is 0 0.7. All right, so regression 3. Yep. All right, so please be careful. Read weakest linear. So weakest closest to 0. Which one is closest to 0? So this is close to positive 1. Okay, now let me look at these three. This is 0 0.0, 0 0.0, 0 0.0, 0 0.0. This one is 0.8. This is 7. That's closer. This is 5. That's closest. So again, just imagine if you had a number line and you're putting these numbers on a number line. Okay, so let me do this one more time just in case you can't visually see it. So again, you have negative 1, 1, and whoever is closest to 0 is going to be the weakest. Um, so let's do this one. This one is negative 0 0.08, so very close to 0, so over here. All right, let's do this one. This one is also very close to 0, 0 7, so that's going to be inside here because it goes negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, and so forth, right? So it's going to be there. All right, then this one is positive, 0 0.8, so it's on the other side, but it's not 0, 0 8, it's 8, 0, so that's really close to 1. And then this next one is negative 0, 5, negative, and then this one was 7, so negative 0 would be here. So this one must be the closest one to 0, and therefore the weakest, or regression 4. So just picture a number line, weakest is close to 0, Strongest is close to positive 1 and negative 1. If it's if they say uh, positive, strong will be positive 1. If they said negative, strong will be negative 1. 